Welcome to Father Matt's Bible Studies and Sermons Podcast. My name is Matthew Mead. I'm the priest and rector at the Parish of Christ the Redeemer in Pelham, New York. In today's Bible study, we read chapter 12 of the Gospel according to St. John. God bless and hope you enjoy the Bible study. Let us pray. Almighty God, send your Holy Spirit to be with us on this beautiful day as we continue to read through the Gospel according to St. John. Fill our minds and our hearts with wisdom and knowledge of your scriptures. All this we ask through Christ our Lord. Amen. All right, we're going to jump right in to chapter 12. And the plan is to get through that today. Chapter 12 has um, several different scenes that are all kind of important and they they sort of flow from one to the next. You will uh, know some of these. It's kind of a bridge chapter to the passion. The last thing we read last week was the raising of Lazarus. And this picks up with the same cast of characters. Uh, the last thing that we read last time also said that they were approaching Passover. Now Passover is only six days away. Um, and... Uh, we'll see as we go through what these different scenes are. James, can you read uh, the first chunk? Mary anoints Jesus. Yes, Mary anoints Jesus. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus's feet and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume, but Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common purse and used to steal what was put into it. Jesus said, leave her alone. She brought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not ha always have me. <laughs> okay. Oh. Great. No, no, no. Stop there. That's good. Okay. Uh, a couple of things. Uh, as noted, it's the same cast of characters. We've Now we've got Mary and Martha. Um, if you're looking for that scene where uh, Jesus says to Mary, to Martha, that Mary has picked the better place, that's actually in St. Luke's gospel. It's, so it's not in this. So some of these people appear in other gospels as well. Um, also in John's gospel, uh, Jesus's feet are anointed and um, in the other Gospels, it's his head. And uh, so there's a couple of little differences here. I'm, I think the reason Jesus's feet are anointed probably looks ahead to the washing of feet that happens in the next chapter. Uh, I'm not 100% sure of that. And the there's a dramaticness to this that she wipes his uh, his feet with her hair which is interesting. I don't I don't know what that specifically means, but uh, it's there. And uh, in this gospel, if you look at this scene in some of the other gospels, it's not always Judas that says this. Uh, in other, I think in Mark, it's the disciples said uh, we're indignant about the use of this. But um, the um, the money issue comes up. And we've heard a little bit about Judas, and actually we've heard about Denari before. The last time we had both Judas and Denari mentioned in, in the same at all was in chapter six during the feeding of the 5,000. And if you remember, um, there was a question about how the how much the food would cost. Um, and also at the end of that, there was a, a note that Jesus's disciples, some of them left him. Uh, but even then, Judas was with them, and Jesus knew that he was going to betray him. Uh, so again, 
we have uh, a negative Judas thing here. And we also have a reference to the denarii. Um, I don't know if you know this or not. Denarii generally is assumed to be one day's sort of as a standard day laborer wage. And so this is the essentially 300 days wages worth of perfumed oil. So it's a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of oil and um, like an absurd amount almost and or absurdly expensive. And it gets, again, looking ahead and um, he, he actually specifically says this, uh, this is for my burial. Um, and uh, she's just used it, interestingly, in advance, but he's going to die and be buried. And when we get to Jesus's burial, at uh, the end in chapter 19, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus use uh, a crazy amount of um, uh, spices and oils to bury Jesus. And so here and there, he's buried like a king would be, like a whole year's sort of salary spent on um, this preparation for his burial here and again later. Uh, the last little thing here is that... Uh, this is often we, you know, why did G uh, Judas do it? Uh, well, it's because he was a thief. Well, it actually comes from this verse. So that's where that reference comes from. It's not in every single gospel that Judas uh, was a, kept the common person, was a thief. So there's a, a reason attributed to him in John. And he used to steal from it. Any um, comments on this section? I think this yeah. has always been a troubling verse for people for what that's worth. Yeah, I, I was hoping that you had an explanation about the hair drying foot thing, but. Well, let's see if. Um, no, there's no note on it. I, I don't. I, I think the foot thing probably links to uh, the foot washing in the next chapter. I think that's yeah. why his feet are anointed. Uh sometimes you know it's hard to tell with john if if he's changing something or correcting something and sometimes he's changing things uh for some theological reason and my guess is that this you know the next time we see somebody cleaning feet or doing like something like that it's jesus mm -hmm. so my guess is that this is in some way shape or form linking the foot washing and true service and his burial. Uh, but I don't have a good question or a good answer about why it's with her hair. And, well, it, seemed, and it seemed to me, I'm sorry to interrupt. It seems to me that it's a humbling kind of thing. And so if she doesn't have a towel or something proper, she's taking part of herself to, to do that. So I, I take it mm. as a humbling uh, kind of thing because that's, that's what she had. Mm. Yeah, exactly. Thank I you. totally agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. Um mm. it, it's a self it's a self-giving in a way that yes. um that is very over the top and not in a bad way. So right. <laughs> um yeah. And it's it's jarring. I mean, if you were there and you saw this scene going on, the whole thing, like mm -hmm. she's literally throwing herself at Jesus's feet. Um and um and waste, not wasting, but from their perspective, wasting all of this expensive oil and using her hair. It's very over the top. Um, and it, it, I started by saying in, in, in Luke's gospel is the scene where Jesus and Mary and Martha are there and, and Martha complains that, uh, that, you know, Mary's not helping. The same thing is going on here. There's just no complaining from Martha, right? She's serving. Lazarus is hanging out. But Mary is uh, the one that's doing this. And so there seems to be one other thing I think you can say is that uh, Mary is one step beyond all of them, right? She's doing something that's, um, she gets it more than the rest of them do for what that's worth. All right. Anything else on this? Um, I did say this. You always have the poor with you, but you, you not always have me. Um, has been uh, uh, 
a verse that pops up from time to time. I'm, I think that uh, the context of this is somewhat straightforward, is that Jesus's earthly ministry is going to end. And um, so, you know, the things that are done to him at, at that time, uh, out of love and uh, adoration for him, uh, are, are fine, uh, is my feeling. So, all right. Um, Charlotte, can you read the plot to kill Lazarus? Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, when the great crowd of the Jews learned that he was there, they came not only because of Jesus, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests planned to put Lazarus to death as well, since it was on account of him that many of the Jews were deserting and were believing in Jesus. All right. Jesus. That's a fairly quick chunk, but, uh, the, it makes it explicit what had gone on, and you can read the next section too, but it makes it explicit what had gone on in the last chapter, um, that uh, unlike Matthew, Mark, and Luke, where there's a whole series of controversies after Palm Sunday, remember we haven't gotten to Palm Sunday yet, it's actually the next section, but a whole series of controversies in Jerusalem after Palm Sunday in Matthew, Mark, and Luke are what end up being the final sort of straws and catalysts that get Jesus crucified. In John, it is crystal clear that it is um, it is because of Lazarus, and not only do they want to kill Jesus at this point, but now they want to kill Lazarus because they want to end the sign itself that was... Uh, so. Um, and uh, and the reason is bluntly given because many of the Jews were deserting and were believing in Jesus. Um, and it's noted, notable that, um, you know, there's plenty of people that seem to believe in Jesus, but it's the chief priests and we'll see later the Pharisees that are the, the, the drivers of all of this. Any comments on that? All right. Uh, we leave behind Lazarus and Mary and Martha at this point, and now we get to Palm Sunday. Charlotte, can you read, can, yeah, keep going, Jesus' triumphal entry? Yes. The next day, the great crowd that had come to the festival heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, Bless, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written, as it is written, do not be afraid, daughter of Zion. Look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written of him and had been done to him. So the crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to testify. It was also because they heard that he had performed this sign that the crowd went to meet him. The Pharisees then said to one another, you see, you can do nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. Great. I think that's the, yep. Okay. Uh, so a couple of things. This is Palm Sunday. We we don't read this, interestingly. Uh, on Palm Sunday every year, we read Matthew, Mark, and Luke in a sequence. And so we never really get to hear this, which is too bad, because um, the... Uh, there's a couple of things in here that I think are actually helpful to hear. Uh, first of all, the the citation is from the the scripture quote is from Zechariah and is used in all the gospels. And that's um, but one of the things I think is really helpful in this particular passage is this line right here. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written of him. And had been done to him. We've talked a decent amount about the sort of two timelines that you can see in John or or two um, time periods. You've got Jesus time and you've got like when it was written time, right? Where the, the narrator or the community and, the, you know, you're 50 years later or whatever it is, they finally put the gospel together and a lot of their um, present day contemporary challenges and realities seem to creep into the gospel narrative. Um, and so it's hard to untangle those two. I like this, though, because 
this is one of the few places where it's pretty blunt. It's like, well, why are all these scripture things in here? And it's like, well, after Jesus was glorified, after he was crucified and rose from the dead, uh, they went back and started remembering the things that he had done and the things that he had said, the things that had been done to him, and started mining, like actively mining the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament, uh, for references that matched up. And so, you know, you get the Palm Sunday uh, narrative, and they go and they find in Zechariah, oh, here it is. Like, this is, you know, the king is coming and sitting on a donkey. Uh, I just, I, I've always liked this verse. I think it's um, it's just kind of nice and explanatory. The uh, the other thing here, uh, the next verse 17, um, is the only reference to this, because the le raising of Lazarus only happens in John. Um, but the crowd that was there with Lazarus at the tomb is still there, right? They're part, they're all part, a good chunk of this crowd on Palm Sunday. Um, and they're testifying to him. And um, and then the other part of the crowd is uh, that, you know, they, they, they went to meet him because they'd heard about it. And so the raising of Lazarus, again, seems to be the major catalyst that um, gets Jesus in trouble with the Pharisees, uh, because everybody is now following him, people that were there, people that were not there. And uh, in the next scene, this whole, the world has gone after him. In the next scene, we will see a bunch of Greeks who literally show the whole world is going after him. Like the, the news of Jesus now is, is spread out beyond just the Jews and the Samaritans um, and, you know, local Roman centurions and what have you to Greeks that are visiting. All right. Any comments on this? All right. Onward. Edda, can you read? Some Greeks wish to see Jesus. Sure. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew, then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. All right, great. Mm -hmm. That's that whole section. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, how convenient. It fits on one page. The uh, uh, couple of things. So... I do think it's important that they're they're not just random Greeks. These are Greeks that are there to worship. And there's a whole class of people that uh, we encounter occasionally from time to time in the New Testament. The Ethiopian eunuch is another one. He's specifically referred to as a God-fearer. There's a whole class of people that were not Jewish, but they... Um, we're familiar with the customs and traditions and uh, and to a degree the scriptures of the Jews and um, observed those customs. It's unclear to me if if they treated them. I think they probably were people that felt, well, this God is as good as this is the local God here, so we're going to worship this local God. So they're not all there, but they are people that seem to take the religion seriously. So I think it is important that uh, that these people are there specifically to worship at the festival. They're not just there hanging out and, um, you know, sightseeing. Uh, anytime in John's gospel, somebody wants to meet Jesus or, or gets brought to Jesus, Philip and Andrew seem to be involved. If you remember back in chapter one, Philip is the one that brought Nathaniel to Jesus Andrew is the one that brought Peter to Jesus. If you remember in chapter six, uh, they're the two that are involved with getting the kid that's got the the the, the small amount of bread and fish uh, back to Jesus so he can do the miracle. And in this case, the two of them work in tandem uh, to get these Greeks to Jesus. So um, just something to note. And... Um, 
then we get uh, a nice kind of mix of St. John theology and stuff that is very familiar from the synoptics from Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, the hour and the Son of Man being glorified is very, very John. This is coming forward. You get something that looks very similar to like one of the parables that Jesus has told about grains in the other Gospels. Um, and you also get something that uh, is very similar to what is said about discipleship and following Jesus with this. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Uh these two verses, 24 and 25, uh, you could basically find exactly in the uh, other Gospels as well. Um, and same with 26. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am there, my servant will also be. Um, and then we sort of get back into John theology, that Jesus and the Father are one, and we'll hear more about that uh, in the next passage. The question I would ask for you is, how does any of this link to the Greeks getting to Jesus. What do you, what do you mean by link? Well, it's it's the follow up, right? The Greeks want to go see Jesus. Mhm. Mm they bring them. Um this is Jesus's answer to uh that the Greeks want to see Jesus. <laughs> His answer no. is the hour has come like the Greeks never get to Jesus. If you actually read really like there, right they just the next section is um jesus speaking about his death right so the greeks never actually get to jesus or i mean presumably they do but um his answer to they want to see you is um well I, the way i think it links is when the when the whole world now is which we heard in the last passage the whole world now is trying to get to jesus that is when the hour is going to happen Right. So it's when the Greeks want to see Jesus, it doesn't even seem to matter that they get there. What matters right. is that they they want to see him. And now so, you know, to from a certain perspective, you've got Jews, Samaritans, um, Gentiles, and now you've got Greeks, which represent the world. Uh, everybody wants to get to Jesus. And now it's time for him to be glorified. Um, and the the. Uh, the little parable here, the grain of wheat falls in the earth. In the other Gospels, you can read that as a resurrection thing, but in the context, you tend to read it more as, um, you know, the growing of the kingdom or something like that. In this, it's so much closer to the, the crucifixion and resurrection um, that it seems clearly linked to that. Um, and usually this is reserved for disciples of Jesus right those who lose their life uh, who love their life uh, lose it and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life but in this context it seems to link to Jesus himself because he's about to lose his life so it's a mix of discipleship and um himself as well but uh yeah it's just I think it's worth taking note that the Greeks never get there right like it's, when you yeah. when you actually like read the text it's like wait a minute they never got there it's similar to uh the thing with nicodemus where he just kind of disappears yeah he's the conversation moves off into a different direction um and i think this is a good example of uh it's not about the greeks here it's about the reader understanding that uh, a lot of this was that the gospel is supposed to spread to the whole world um and uh none of these things seem to have any reference point uh to um you know a particular time and place so it's for all of us um that's my hmm. any uh any thoughts on this now the first sentence says now among those who went up to the work to worship at the festival were some greeks so it looks like some greeks got there so maybe they just weren't written about um well yeah. They, so there was, um, that was what I was, I think what I was saying at the beginning there, there's a whole c class of people that, um, took the religion serious, the Judaism seriously, okay. uh, Christianity, not Christianity took Judaism. Got you. Okay. Yes. And they're there to worship 
alongside the Jews. Jews, gotcha. Got and you. but they're not Jews. They are just there um, to worship, and okay. uh, that yeah. I, that does they they got there to the festival to Jerusalem, but then they want to go deeper to see Jesus. Right, we've had yes. throughout the whole gospel that Jesus is in some way sort of the the, the festivals um, and the signs that he does uh, point towards Jesus, and right. he's sort of the true, um, you know, full version of these things. So they get it in the sense that okay, they're there for the festival, but they really want to see is Jesus. Right. But when okay. Philip and Andrew tell Jesus, we never actually see the narrative where jesus talks to the greeks in at all right, right? right. Mm -hmm. uh, got it yeah all right anything else on this all right um who just read was it etta or charlotte it was etta okay it was me okay mm -hmm. um sorry uh jd can you read jesus speaks about his death now my soul is troubled and what shall i say Father, save me from this hour? No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorif Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said that it was thunder. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out, and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. The crowd answered him, We have heard from the law that the Messiah remains forever. How can you say that the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Jesus said to him, The light is in you for, the, for a little longer. Walk while you have the light, so that the darkness may not overtake you. If you walk in the darkness, you do not know where you are going. While you have the light, believe in the light, so that you may become children of light. Great. Okay. A um, couple of things. Up until this point, the hour has seemed pretty positive, right? Um, it's the hour when Jesus is going to be glorified, right? My hour has not yet come. Uh, and now it seems something that's troubling. And uh, we get in the synoptics the line about, and it's, um, it's almost in the Lord's Prayer, honestly, but we get the, you know, uh, save us from the time of trial, um is one way uh in the synopt in Matthew Mark and Luke Jesus uh prays that you know if this is your will let it be done that there's there's some kind of back and forth that Jesus doesn't seem to, to really want to go forward unless it's the father's will with the passion and crucifixion uh in John this is kind of bluntly no that's not um uh, that's not what's going to happen. The whole reason Jesus is there is to come to this hour, um, and that will glorify God. One of the things we don't get in St. John's Gospel, I don't know if you've noticed it, but in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, there's this thing called the Transfiguration, which is on the mountaintop where Jesus is with Moses and Elijah, and uh, a voice from heaven says, this is my son, we do not get that at all in John, and um, the only time we get voices from heaven in the gospel narratives are at the transfiguration and at Jesus's baptism. And so one way of thinking about this passage is that this voice from heaven is sort of the equivalent of the transfiguration in John, um, that the, the voice is there and the people don't understand it. Um, and uh, anyway, then it, this is the beginning of the end, so to speak. Um, the hour is when judgment happens and the ruler of this world is driven out. And then there's an interesting play on lifted up. And I think you can 
we saw it earlier in chapter three, when just like Moses lifted up the serpent, if you remember that, and the people saw the bronze serpent and they were saved, so they'll look at the Son of Man when he's lifted up. Um, that seemed an overt reference to the crucifixion. Um, this lifted up, it, I think you can read it in a couple of different ways. It could be lifted up on the cross. It could be lifted up and raised from the dead. It could be lifted up in the ascension in some way, right? So you've kind of got a three three way thing, um, and the crowd hears it as uh, the Messiah is supposed to remain forever. They hear it as being lifted up and leaving for what that's worth. So there's a couple of different um, different ways, and I think that uh, we've seen throughout that whenever people are uh, understand something that Jesus has said that can be interpreted in a couple of ways, they tend to not get it correct. And in this, yeah. um, it's, uh, uh, you know, their question is, is who is the son of man? Um, and his answer is sort of classic John. Well, while you've got the light, walk in the light. Um, anyway, that's all I have on this. Any, any thoughts or comments on this chunk? Go back just for a little bit. Anything at all? Okay. Um, let's see, what do we got? We got two more things. James, can you read the unbelief of the people? The unbelief of the people. After Jesus had said this, he departed and hid from them. Although he had performed so many signs in their presence, they did not believe in him. This was to fulfill the words spoken by the prophet Isaiah. Lord, who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? And so they could not believe, because Isaiah also said, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, so that they might not look with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. Isaiah said this because he saw his glory and spoke about him, Nevertheless, many even of the authorities believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess it for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue. For they loved human glory more than the glory that comes from God. Great. Okay. Uh, I like this passage. This is one of those, you know, kind of. Why was it that people didn't believe in Jesus, even though he had been doing all these things? And the answer is pretty straightforward. Well, it was foretold by Isaiah and others, um, and so they weren't going to believe even if it was there. And then there's a secondary answer given at the end, which is because, or three answers, others don't believe it because they're worried they're going to get thrown into the synagogue, and still others um, uh, love human glory more than the glory of that comes from God. Uh, JD, you had something, I think. Yeah, I mean, it seems to me that, I mean, we were talking, they're talking earlier about how the elders and the Pharisees are all upset because all these people that are leaving him, you know, because of all the people who are leaving him, because they believe, because they've seen Lazarus. And so there's this, apparently this crowd that's following him. And then now you get this part where it's like, no, they're not believing them. Right. So it's like, did everybody suddenly just like go home? <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean, uh, yeah. I, I, I'm a little lost. I, well, so throughout this, it's the crowd has been fickle. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I yeah. guess, yeah. Right. This, they, they believe in him and then they don't. And, mm -hmm. and then it's, it's also it's there's always been division. And one of the things in this, um, you know, who's the they? Um, if you go back, it's the crowd. Um, but OK, so it, it, some in the crowd believe some don't some. Uh, it's been like this throughout the whole gospel. And um and more and more people are believing and also more and more people are not believing. And what, what you get is a, um, 
a division in the crowd. And here you get also uh, many, even of the authorities, believed in him. This is the first time we've heard about this, right? We had just Nicodemus um, uh, earlier, and now we've got, no, 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 there's many. So there's a division in them. But throughout this, very few people are all in. They're kind of, you know, they're kind of in, and then they're kind of back out. And, um, right, even of the many that believed in him, they did not confess it. Right. So um, it's fickle. The crowd comes back and forth and um, that goes throughout the whole gospel. I mean, we just had it's like this in all the gospels. You move pretty rapidly from a crowd chanting Hosanna. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord on Sunday. Yeah. And by Friday, it's they're saying crucify him. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's not like it's unique to John. It's um, we just get a little bit more of the insight into the belief or lack of belief of the crowd in John than we do in the other gospels. But you know what I think too? I think, you, you know, you are looking at a whole mindset being changed. People believe very heavily in one thing. And so as they hear it, yes, yeah, sounds pretty good. Then something happens that seems to be almost too good to be true. So now they're not sure whether this is truly happening or not. And I just think that as, the mindset goes as they really are listening. And that seems to be the course that any change of belief takes. So we see this and the fact that they are fickle, you know, you go to one neighbor's house, they're talking one thing, you go to other neighbor's house, they're talking something else. And so you do go back and forth until you finally in your heart and in your mind feel like this is the thing that you believe in and you see it and, um, and you feel it's a good thing. So I'm not surprised that they are fickle, like you say too, but going from Monday to Friday, that is a very quick turn. But um, I understand the um, the trepidation and, and some of the things are so magnificent that people can't believe that a human can do that. I, I guess the other thing would be too, I suppose in this time, like if you got thrown out of your temple, Yes, yes, right? that's big. That's a huge thing, right? It's big now. If, right. I mean, if you can't, if you can't go to your, like, because the, right. the elders of the Pharisees could throw you, throw you out of your temple, right? Which mm -hmm. is the fear you'd be put out of your synagogue. So if you're put out, you're pretty ostracized, right? Yeah. Yes, so, that's big. Right. So that would be a pretty harsh, you know, thing to have happen to you. So you better be. If you're going to be in, you got to be all in right. in order to take that step. So yeah. it, it brings. Yeah, so I see that it it does bring up again the two uh, time periods. You know, there there is uh, some significant evidence that by the time you get to John's, you know, when the gospel is written, that the separation between Christians and Jews was actively going on, and they were being asked out of the synagogues it's not very clear that that was actually going on in jesus's actual time and if you think about it this line in jesus's time really like they're within a couple of days of lazarus they're throwing people out of the synagogue i mean think about that for a second it's mm -hmm. unlikely um that's probably being uh put in from the perspective of the evangelist of why is it it's not it's not just a question of why is it that people didn't believe in Jesus's day it's also a question in the evangelist's day and it's a question in our day and throughout history why is it that people have not believed in this thing that we believe in and the answers that John gives are because some have been blinded, as the prophets said, and others are afraid um, because they like human glory more than uh, mm -hmm. others are afraid, and others like mm -hmm. human glory. There's a couple of different reasons here that are mm -hmm. given, but it's not just a question of why was this the case in Jesus's time. I think when you read it, it's always a question in your own time as well. Why is it that not everybody is believing uh, in this? 
And that gets into, um, you know, real personal stuff too, where you have in families, it's not just why don't my friends or my coworkers, it's why is it that sometimes in families, some person believes and somebody doesn't, or somebody who used to go to church all the time doesn't. Um, it's the same kind of question. And if you think of it from that perspective, these are not very satisfying answers. Fear and because we would not necessarily attribute that to everybody else. But this is a different one um, that they don't understand. That's it. You know, they just don't understand. Um, they look, uh, it, it, it's right in front of them, but they're they're not able to understand. So, yeah, it, it's uh, a, lot, a lot in there, I think. Okay. But you know what's interesting also is that what's left out is the tough message of Jesus, right? Because you remember when he's starting with the disciples, he's basically saying, leave everything behind. Leave your parents, everyone, just follow me. You don't need any belongings. He's telling people, get rid of everything, you know? So it's a really hard message. Love one another. And these people live in a time where they're constantly at war. So that's a, a whole other component. Right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Tricky stuff. All right, we got one more passage which summarizes Jesus' teaching. Actually, pretty well. Uh, Etta, can you read this? I think you got the shortest passage. Okay. Then Jesus cried aloud, Whoever believes in me believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And whoever sees me sees him who sent me. I have come as light into the world so that everyone who believes in me should not remain in the darkness. I do not judge anyone who hears my words and does not keep them. For I am I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. The one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. On the last day, the word that I have spoken will serve as judge. For I have not spoken on my own, but the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment about what to say and what to speak. And I know that his commandment is eternal life. What I speak, therefore, I speak just as the Father has told me. Right. Okay. We get this is kind of like a catch all of things we've read and heard before light, judgment, witnessing, testifying, uh, eternal life. Um, I, I, I think we've heard all light and darkness. Um, it, it, it's not a, the, one of the things about, I would say about St. John's Gospel is it's, um, uh, it's real tricky to sort of get a, what would be called a systematic theology out of it, because uh, right here, like, I don't judge anyone who hears my words and does not keep them. But then like a verse later, um, the one who rejects me and does not receive my words as a judge, um, on the last day of the word that I have spoken will be serve as a judge. So you don't get judged, but you're going to get judged. It doesn't, you know, um, I think that the whole point of this is um is really take the opportunity now um and if you don't take the opportunity now take it as soon as you can because at some point on the last day um you know you are going to get judged so take it as soon as you can i think is really the the logic here um uh you know don't remain in the darkness come forward to the light as soon as you can um, and why is that? Why should you, because at the end of the day, Jesus and the father, you know, are basic are one. And, and what, what Jesus is saying is coming directly from the father. Um, and that will give you eternal life. So that's my not great summary of the summary. Well, Any thoughts? I mean, I was looking at it as, you know, individual people, don't you be the judge, you know, the father's going to be the judge. You know, it's not for all of you, you know, to sit around and judge people. That'll be taken care of on the last day by by God, you know, like, yeah, don't everybody sit around here going, well, he's, which is what everybody, but which is what a lot of people do. You know, you got whole groups of people now who, you know, judge people by their version of what the Bible says, you know, and I was, I mean, I was looking at it as saying, that's, he's telling them, don't you do it, 
Well, he yeah. specifically says that in the other gospels, you know, judge mm -hmm. not lest ye be right. right. <laughs> um, right. The, right. Yeah. Well, and, and throughout John's gospel, what, what I think is fascinating here is earlier, he did say the son of man comes in judgment. <laughs> now he says, yeah, right. I right. do not right. judge right. anyone. <laughs> it's like, right. Uh, Hello. It's, uh, there, right. But that's still about him. That's not, you know, about yeah. individual, about the rest of us. Right. No, certainly none of us are supposed to be the judge here. It it basically right. this is this is it's it's up to God on the last day is right. what the judgment is about. Yeah. Yep. Uh anything on this? Any other comments? All right. Um next week we will read uh, the Last Supper, which is the washing of feet in John. Next week is also the last class um, until the until September. So we'll get through the washing of feet, and that will be a nice kickoff or send off to a very long chunk that we'll pick up again in September, which is the chapter 14, 15, 16, and 17 discourse on discipleship um ending in a long prayer by jesus uh which which is a bit of a slog to get through so uh any final thoughts on this before we reconvene again next week all right i'll see maybe all of you for lunch later and some of you for lunch tomorrow <laughs> <laughs> all right. okay maybe thank you bye have a good day Thank you for listening to Father Matt's Bible Studies and Sermons podcast. If you want to learn more, you can visit our website at ChristChurchPelham.org. ChristChurchPelham.org. God bless and have a great day.